Turns out I'm, I'm a professional amateur, and I'm going to put this on my on my YouTube channel, which is cleverly named Penny Nelson. <laughs> okay, I am Penny Nelson. Oh, <laughs> you are waiting for the rest. <laughs> Even just addressing who I am was so hard for me when I came to Cornerstone CR in September of 2020 for the first time. But I'm going to start with a prayer and with a scripture in, uh, in Psalms 37.5. It says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help. He will <laughs> trust him to help you do it and he will. Trust him to help you do it and he will. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Even after my friend has so eloquently prayed, I am able to pray for all of my friends here, Lord. And I just pray that you would be glorified, Lord, that you would be seen clearly. Jesus in a penny vessel, Lord. I trust you. I thank you. I worship you. And I pray for all of my friends. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First of all, I would like to bring your attention to the 12th step. We um, happen to just go over the, the, the principles, but I'm going to read to you the 12th step. And the 12th step says, Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try, to, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So greetings and a big thanks to all of my newfound recovery forever family. I am so grateful to be in this moment here together with all of you. Thank you in advance for listening to God's story through me. I pray our time together would be an encouragement to you and you would find strength to take just one more step in your recovery journey. I boldly proclaim there is hope. You can change, and it is not too late. Freedom and deliverance from whatever wound, hurt, habit, or hang-up that you have is not only probable, it is possible. And let me introduce myself to you. After my first Celebrate Recovery meeting, I wrestled with who am I? And how do I define my problems? <laughs> Before the next Wednesday meeting, I rewrote it several times and landed on this way too long introduction. I proved prerequisite to say I may struggle with perfectionism. I am Penny Nelson, one of the disreputable riffraff that became a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. Yes. Oh, <laughs> we already did that part, right? We already did that. Oh, okay. I got lost. I'm scared. Okay. Okay. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ and the eternal King of all, and I am grateful that through Christ I celebrate victory from smoking pot for 33 years and freedom from sugary treats for two years. I am in recovery for compulsive overeating, for addiction to my own comfort, and codependence. Codependence is the mistaken belief that interior, inferior feelings can be controlled by control. And my joke is, like a good codependent, I started coming here to help someone else. I had a big codependent definition aha moment in my first open share meeting when we went over the guidelines. One of the guidelines states, we are here to support one another and not fix one another. Not fix one another. The words kept repeating in my mind. As a wife, mother, an evangelistic Christian, I couldn't remember a time 
the last time that I wasn't trying to fix someone or help someone, and I came to realize I had work to do in that area. Let me give you a little of my background and then contrast the two areas, areas of victory that God has already brought about in my life, freedom from smoking pot and freedom from sugar retreats. I was born in 1968 in Evanston, Illinois. At the age of four, I remember my first experience with melancholy. Melancholy, a deep, excuse me, a feeling of deep, reflective thought and sadness, typically with no obvious cause. A suggestive or expressive sadness or depression of mind and spirit. I had many bouts of melancholy and at age 10 made my first of three attempts to end my life and silence the obtrusive thoughts that were loudly bullying me in my mind. My family was forced to hospitalize me to save my life. I had started smoking daily, smoking marijuana at age 13 to self-medicate the pain and sadness. I had angry outbursts of self-harm. I stole money and I lied to support my drug use. I was controlled by a powerful vacuum trying to suck affirmation and approval from others with no lasting satisfaction. As time went on, I developed a few secret friends that did aid in my calming and self-soothing apart from relying on trusting human relationships. Oh, those secret friends that have many names and faces, are vices or addictions of choice or slavery. They start out looking like an innocent kitten only to later be identified as a fire-breathing, raging, hungry dragon. This dragon demands all of our time, feeding him, and he is never satisfied. And since it is CR, my dragons have been using drugs, controlling others, people-pleasing, masturbating, compulsive exercise, smoking and drinking alcohol, and consuming way too much food. Part of what brought me to CR was my realization that my dragon of consuming too much sugar had shape-shifted into consuming too much other food, even when not hungry. Unfortunately, Anything earthly used to fill an empty human heart, apart from a relationship with Christ, never works well or for very long. Amen. My earthly father left our family and divorced my mother when I was age five. My mother allowed me to move away from my family and live with my grandmother at age ten. I perceived both of these events as rejection and saw no value in myself. I even changed my name to Penny, which means has value, to no avail. Compounded with this rejection was my heavy depression. My family was non-religious and I never attended church, read the Bible, or knew anyone who talked about God or Jesus. I just did not know anyone who knew him or talked about Christ until I was 19. In 1984, at the age of 15, I was placed, I lost my place. <laughs> I don't know why I moved the page. When I was 15, I was placed in a long-term drug rehab in Carbondale, Illinois. I spent 18 months and most of my adolescence in a group home setting. I successfully left the group home 
and went right back to drug use. When I was 19 years old, a stranger came to my house and explained to me that I must choose to surrender my life and self to the one true God, Jesus. I had never heard this message of the Bible or God sending his son, Jesus, in a flesh to pay for my sins. I also knew that my sin was very great. I also knew that I was powerless against the forces of evil around me and inside of me. I learned that Jesus has power over everything, and he is the king, master, and ruler of all things. He is the God of gods. This stranger told me that God loves me and was not angry with me for my great sin, and he would forgive me if I would turn from my sinful ways and to surrender to him and follow him only for the rest of my days. When I was 19, I actually already knew it all. <laughs> and I found it difficult to believe that God would forgive me and that he loved me. Also, I wanted to keep my life for myself and be the boss of myself. So I rejected God's offer to me. A few years went by and my mind became more troubled and unstable. I used many dragon idols to relieve the pain and sadness and to calm my mind. In time, it became clear that I was not the master of myself, but sin was my master. I could not get free of my evil desires and actions. In 1988, at age 20, I placed my faith in Christ as Savior and turned from my sin. In John 3.3, 3, the Bible says, you must be born again of God's Spirit. I know I was born of God's Spirit because I was different. I instantly did not have a desire to smoke marijuana anymore. I never have smoked pot again to this day, 33 years later. <laughs> I want to stress that God has put my glory to Him. I want to stress that God changed my desires on the inside, and I did not know that this was going to happen before I trusted Christ. Christ. In 1991, Richard asked for my life in marriage covenant with Christ. We committed to each other and in service to our Lord in ministry and evangelism of the lost. We quickly had three beautiful girls. And I was privileged to be a stay-at-home mom to raise our five children to know God. We bought a beautiful home, a fence yard, and settled in for a happily ever after. Except for melancholy. <laughs> Among all the pages in the chapter of this fairy tale ending, I still struggled and mostly lost to debilitating depression. Added to this sorrow was a large dose of shame and guilt concerning my mental health. How awful that a privileged American Christian such as myself would not, could not win the battle in my mind. Nor could I permanently silence the tormenting voices that played on repeat non-stop. I was told to stop sinning, pull myself up by my bootstraps, change my mind, and just function properly. That sounds good in theory, but it didn't work that way for me. Everyone, including me, has three parts that make up their being, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to change. This is a good place for me to remember the promises and the goodness of God. From Romans 4, 17 and 18, the message, When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed God anyway deciding not to live on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but believing what God said he would do. 
When I first cried out to Jesus in 1980, he responded by completely freeing me of the desire I had for weed. I had no more desire to use weed to fill the emptiness and pain. God also did a slower work over many years to bring healing from internal emotional pain. But because of my instant healing at conversion, I experienced much frustration in my journey to be free of sugar addiction. Many people feel that sugar is just as addicting as hard drugs. But overeating and sugar consumption is encouraged for our, by our society. It is socially acceptable to indulge in gluttony. Added to my frustration was the fact that unlike smoking, where when you quit, you just never do that action again. I am forced to face the burden of sugar three times a day, plus snacks. Now I would like to explain the very different type of journey God did over the years. It was in 2012 that God started dealing with me about giving up sugar. I had to notice and admit that my sugar consumption had all the qualities of addiction. I stole sugary items. I lied about my eating. I greedily ate in secret. I did not share. I did not have self-control. I even banned sugary items from my house and demanded that my family hide their tempting items. But all of this did not restrain my desire. How could sugary treats have a voice and scream at me from the kitchen? My thoughts would obsess until the whole sugary item was completely gone. Many times, I have eaten 12 servings of dessert, one sliver at a time, in secret. Then, the guilt and shame of hiding the evidence, secretly eating alone in the car, and worst of all, lust is never satisfied. All of the promises that I made to myself that I would have just one more, just one more bite, just one more. That would scratch the itch, but it never worked. I was ashamed of my behavior, and I was mad at myself. Now, I pray that you will follow me at this point in understanding God's provision and his not instant healing for me and victory over treats. In 2014, I read a book by Gary Smalley called Food and Love. And on page 172, to give credit to the right person, he explains the steps to lifelong victory. For some reason, the way he explained it gave me hope that things could change. I reasoned that God has delivered me from the bondage and slavery of always wanting to smoke pot. And now, I have no desire, or do I want to smoke pot? So he could do the same thing with sugar. For example, I make bar soap. Never do I obsess about using soap to satisfy myself. It's just not enough. It just never crosses my mind. The steps Gary Smalley detailed are very similar to the recovery steps and principles. And I want to clearly proclaim that God does indeed have provision for you, and you will never be able to earn it. That is why it is so important for us to share the workings of God with other people, with words, in testimony, even if we do it clumsily. I share that you might have hope. Okay, so the first thing he said was identify your problem area. In the, in the steps of the principles, that's admitting that life is unmanageable. The second thing he said was admit your inadequacy. In the steps, that's admitting that we are powerless. Next, cry out to God. That's God exists. The next one is believe God will rescue you. That's he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I have to admit, I have trouble with this one. I have difficult 
difficulty believing for myself. Others, yes, me, no. <laughs> and now here was the hardest part for me. Be willing to wait as long as it takes. Next, expect God to give you a breakthrough. Belief is just a choice, and it is not a feeling. Faith is a decision to believe. I promise God has given you enough. Uh-oh. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm confused. Okay, where was I? Oh, here it is. Faith is a decision to believe. I promise God has given you enough. Just use the mustard seed that you have. Then finally, pray faithfully and persistently. Ask God every day. This is the part where we tend to get weary and give up. I did. It was just a repeated daily process of repentance and surrender. Repentance is turning from X, Y, Z, name your dragon, idol, and then turn to him. Put down anything you are clinging to, open your hands and let go, then turn to God and cling to him. Surrender unconditionally and wait expectantly. In 2018, God came through and used some events to deliver me from sugar treats, sugary treats. And it was not a lightning strike or a part the Red Sea moment. It was a slow, steady, difficult plotting. It took three months of complete sugar abstinence before I realized surreally that I was free. I was actually free from sugar with no cravings or desire for treats. It was at that time that I had my first few experiences of forgetting about sweets. Candy lost its voice, and I found some in my car that I had forgotten about. That was incredulous. Then I found a treat my son had baked and didn't finish in the oven several weeks later. I looked at the dried up previously coveted treat in disbelief. It still seems somewhat surreal to me now, and in December of 2021, it will be three years. <laughs> Let's walk through the steps of my deliverance the second time with sugar. First, I opened up the closet door in my heart and exposed the dragon idol of sugar. I decided to stop feeding this ravenous beast, and eventually the big stony statue was full pulled from the closet of secrets and shame. It was exposed to the light for inventory and evaluation. It was then clear that this item would need to be smashed into smaller workable bits that could be removed permanently. It was a painstaking process, and yet, suddenly it was done by God's grace. Amen. It is my desire that all of my affection, devotion, and the practical demonstration of a life of worship would be for Christ alone even in secret. Deuteronomy says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. It turns out, I've got a lot of all. Some time during the pandemic in my prayer time, I took a look at the spiritual small closet of secrets in my heart. With the door now flung wide open, with a 500 watt light bulb, removing all the shadows, I noticed in the closet a much smaller, very attractive dragon idol 
of compulsive, compulsive overeating. I had a choice. I could close the door again on my beloved dragon idol. After all, it really is kind of small, kind of cute and pretty. It doesn't affect anyone but me. Or I could recall to mind the pain of allowing that cute little kitten to grow in the dark and shame of the closet until it was a loud until it was loudly breathing fire and demanding its pound of flesh plus snacks each day. I chose to leave the light on and the door open and start coming to celebrate recovery. My first obstacle was committing to weekly meetings. <laughs> but I reasoned I could give it one year. My next challenge was doing a step study. That would require daily time and commitment to write in the step study book. It would require honesty and trust. They say you can tell what a person loves by looking at two things. What do they spend their time on? And where do they spend their money? That reveals your heart and your true love. I calculated that I would need to invest daily time in the complete process of a step study. I was afraid, but sometimes, hmm, gets an incomplete sentence. Let me figure it out. But sometimes, hmm, sometimes. Let's see it. Sometimes it looks like, I don't know, it looks like effort and daily discipline. Sometimes love, that's what it is. It's missing love. Sometimes love looks like effort and daily discipline. How fuzzy is that? It's not very fuzzy at all. Okay, now to the chip, the blue chip, the beginning of the journey. Oh, that is so hard. It is so hard. You hear me get excited about it, I do. I get so excited for you and with you. I had that blue chip, and I wondered if I would ever get to 30 days. How can a person define and comply and eat normally without compulsion and overindulgence? Later for them, how do I do it? I wanted a roadmap with step-by-step -step highlighting, printed directions. How am I ever going to get there? How will I ever get there? One step at a time. One principle at a time. One page at a time. One moment at a time. One meeting at a time. One call to an accountability partner at a time. And you really today you should get some numbers. One open share at a time. One day at a time. Just the next right thing. thing. Finally, after six months of trying, I received my 30-day red chip last week. And I have a specific plan for the next 30 days. And I choose to remember that the grace and victory that God has done in removing my other dragon idols. Many times we look at our life and our story in the middle of the chapter and we are not pleased with the potential plot twist. We see a mystery and the villainy in ourselves, and the shortage of likely heroes, and the abundance of clowns. And if you're like me, you sassily grouch at the creator of all things, the head potter, and say, why did you make me this way? He doesn't always give me the answers to my specific questions, 
but in my years of getting to know God, I am more confident as I continue to surrender each day and place my trust in faith in his never failing goodness and mercy, the person, Jesus Christ. It is purely his goodness and not any of my works. Although I will never be good enough and God does not need me, he wants me just as he wants you, my dear friend. In closing, I'd like, to, I'd like to give the King of Kings, my Lord and Master, a, a loud round of applause. I ask you to join me and clap like, like you would if you were free from your dragon idol right now. Okay, right now. Scripture prayer. Do you remember step 12? Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others, practice these principles in all our affairs. From Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to pray for you. Keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. That you, my recovery friend, would understand the provision and resources God has available in advance for his redeemed child. And through his son or daughter, and to his peculiar possession, his people, <laughs> through this forever family, the living stones that are the church. I pray you, my friend, would take hold of the hope and power made available, made available to those of us who have the most feeble and ridiculous looking mustard seed of faith and belief. I also say in the face of my own personal experiences, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. The power that you have, Lord, that you use through those of us who are truly powerless, is the same mighty strength demonstrated when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him on the right hand in the heavenly realms. It's the end of the prayer. The only reasonable and logical response to you, Lord, and to your offer of forgiveness and eternal life is to humbly receive your gift in unconditional surrender and continued devotion, however that looks. So I am going to do something different, and I'm going to set my Hello Kitty timer for two minutes. It's going to ding after two minutes. And I'm going to ask you to join me in a time of personal, private response and prayer. So just right in your seat, I ask you to bow your head and talk to Jesus now.
Yeah, that seems like a long time, doesn't it? Thank you for allowing me to share.